I am an African. I owe my being to the hills and the valleys, the mountains and the glades, the rivers, the deserts, the trees, the flowers, the seas, and the ever-changing seasons that define the face of our native land. My body has frozen in our frosts and in our latter-day snows. It has thawed in the warmth of our sunshine and melted in the heat of the midday sun. The crack and the rumble of the summer thunders, lashed by startling lightning, have been a cause both of trembling and of hope. The fragrances of nature have been as pleasant to us as the sight of the wild blooms of the citizens of the felt. The dramatic shapes of the dragon's back, the soil-colored waters of the Likwa, Ikreli, Lotuga, and the sands of the Kharahad have all been panels of the set on the natural stage on which we act out the foolish deeds of the theater of the day. At times, and in fear, I have wondered whether I should concede equal citizenship of our country to the leopard and the lion, the elephant and the springbok the hyena, the black mamba, and the pestilential mosquito. A human presence among all of these, a feature on the face of our native land just defined, I know that none dare challenge me when I say I am an African. I am the grandchild of the warrior men and women that incense the Kukuni land. Patriots at Setuayon and Pepu took to battle. The soldiers Mushweshwe and Gungunyane taught never to dishonor the cause of freedom. I am the child of Nongaose. I am he who made it possible to trade in the world markets in diamonds and gold and the same food for which our stomachs yearn. Being part of all of these people and in the knowledge that none dares contest that assertion, I shall claim that I'm an African. Today, it feels good to be an African. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Wumbeki uh, Africa Day Lecture. Um, can we please have everyone come on closer down, s'il vous plaît, bonsoir, bienvenue. Pour tous ceux qui sont assis derrière, si vous pouvez s'il vous plaît, déplacez et nous joindre plus, plus bas. Okay. Once again, good afternoon, esteemed guests, dignitaries, scholars, and of course, all members of the public who have joined us today in the beautiful city of Conakry. As well as those following us, of course, um, with our viewing our proceedings virtually. I am Madame Sako Fatima Koroma. I will be your program director for this important day and enlightful event. Uh, we gather here in this dynamic city in Conakry, Republic of Guinea, for the 13th Ebu Mbeki uh, Africa Day Lecture as a first outside of South Africa, truly manifesting the TMF's uh, commitment to the being a Pan-African organization. Before we formally start, we will, it is only befitting that we start with our uh, opening prayers to invoke blessings and guidance for our today's event. Um, may I humbly invite our respected Imam Bangura and our Reverend, the Catholic Bishop Reverend Raphael Sano on the stage to lead us with an opening prayer. Their words will help
to set the tone for our discussion and ensure we our approach and subject matter with wisdom and compassion. Imam and brethren. Please welcome Imam Bangura and Reverend Sanyo. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafi khalqillah. Muhammad ibn abdillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira. Monsieur le Président, Taboumbeki, Excellence Taboumbeki, Monsieur le Ministre des Affaires étrangères et des Guinéens de l'étranger, Son Excellence Monsieur Mori Sanda Kouyaté, Mesdames et Messieurs, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Je voudrais d'abord remercier et féliciter cette Assemblée d'avoir choisi d'ouvrir cette cérémonie par le nom d'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Le prophète Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nous dit « Kullu amrin dhi balin la yuftah bi dhikrillah fa huwa abtar » Il dit « Toute chose importante qui n'est pas commencée par le nom de Dieu est inutile. » Donc Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, cette assemblée a choisi votre nom pour débuter cette cérémonie. Je vous prie, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, de bénir cette assemblée et d'y mettre la baraka. Mettre, bénir toutes les activités qui vont se passer ici ce soir. Allahumma salli wa baraka ala muhammadin wa ala ali muhammadin kama salli wa baraka ala ibrahim wa ala ala ibrahim wa ala ala ibrahim wa ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم أحسن عقبتنا في الدنيا والآخرة اللهم وفقنا لما تحبه وترضاه اللهم وفقنا لما تحبه وترضاه اللهم خذ بناصيتنا إلى ما فيه صلاح البلاد والعباد اللهم خذ بناصيتنا وبنواصينا إلى ما فيه صلاح الإباد والعباد ربنا اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تهول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تحون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسمائنا وأبصارنا وقواتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثاغنا لا من ظلمنا وانصرنا لا من عادانا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر حمنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين This is the minister in charge of uh, religious Amen. affairs of the country of Guinea Prions. and he just made uh, some blessings and prayers Dieu. Le Dieu This is uh, the other prayer and blessing from the Brothers in Christianity. He is now blessing in uh, citing uh, the verses of the Bible. God, the Lord, is once we are here. I want to speak to you directly. And Seigneur, tu as créé ce jour et tu l'as créé merveilleux. C'est toi us. qui as fait les autorités. You de made ce everything pays. possible. And Nous te remercions pour la vie des autorités de ce like pays. Thank you for given birth. Nous prions que tu les fortifies. You, we Nous prions que, que tu les encourages. And you Nous prions them. que tu veilles sur eux. You, Nous we prions, that Seigneur, you protect them and que watch tu over leur donnes la sagesse and give them your wisdom and the lights and lead the, the country in the right and path. We and we pray that transition transition in the very good conditions and the, the violence started in the country be stopped and completely wiped away. The Lord, we will continue to pray for you because South Africa and Guinea 
from the beginning with our first leaders have collaborated together up to the African, South African independence. And that today we see the second African, South, the second president of South Africa creating and representing this foundation that has never existed before. We pray that you're giving all the strength and wisdom in life and we entrusted you with this responsibility that when this foundation succeeds and all people that will be chosen to lead this foundation in integrity and honesty so that both intelligence and wisdom prevails and, and lead them to the right direction. We will really thank you that President Tabombeki that we have heard and we saw and all things and work that he did in South Africa that he helped us lead us here in Guinea to succeed in the transition of Guinea. We ask you that his voice be heard everywhere he goes and anywhere he will be at any time on behalf of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ come next to the president of Guinea that he be helped to be completing this work so that he faith in the name of God again we really pray that you take out and wipe away all violence in Guinea so that we come back to peace, peace be restored and work together so that because you are the man who made Guinea and the population of Guinea, you are the one who created Guinea and all Guineans be happy and enrich the soil and the territory so that we won't have any ethnicity problems that we speak only one language on one word. You have created the one. We only speak of Guineans of in Guinea in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus Christ. All the glory is to you. We pray that everything succeeds in, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The glory be sanctified. Amen. Now rise and pay respect to our shared heritage and dreams with playing with the playing of the national anthems. We will first be proud to hear the strings of the national anthem of the Guinean, the Republic of Guinea, and will be followed by the national anthem of the African Union.
gather here today, we are reminded of the call made by our African political leaders in 1963. The 25th of May must be used to focus on advancing the goals of the co continent has set for itself. We honor this commitment to our beloved continent and the diverse people who call it home. It is particularly significant that we find ourselves in Conakry, beginning this year, the first time ever for this event to be outside of South Africa. This shift speaks to the Pan-African vision the Tebu Mbeki Foundation embodies and is committed to. Guinea is a nation of rich history and potential, and it stands as a beacon of hope in our collective African journey. I would like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors, Anglo Gold Ashanti, the African Development Bank, and MTN Group. Without their support, this event wouldn't be possible. Anglo, Anglo Gold Ashanti, the African Development Bank, and MTN Group, your commitment to the promotion of African unity, the development and intellectual discourse is truly commendable. We appreciate your contribution and your shared vision in creating a prosperous Africa. This afternoon, we are, we are in for an intellectual treat. We will hear Professor Siba Grovogi, a highly esteemed Guinean political scientist and scholar, who will enlighten us on the challenges of fragility and security in West Africa and how these intersect with the economic development. His insights are a paramount of importance as we consider the future of our continent and how we can collectively move towards progress and prosperity. Today's lecture is not merely about listening. It is an invitation for all of us to engage critically and thoughtfully, to question, to learn, and to imagine a future where our continent is defined by peace, prosperity, and progress. This event is also a testament of the power of knowledge and dialogue as a catalyst for the transformative change. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that our gathering takes place amidst the reality and challenges of the rapidly evolving global context. As we navigate through these uncertain times, that let us remember that through unity, dialogue, collaboration, we will overcome the obstacles in our path. Let us remember the words of the great Ghanaian scholar and Pan-Africanist, um, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who once said, I am not an African because I was born in Africa, but because Africa was born in me. As we delve into today's proceedings, let us keep these words close to our hearts as a reminder of our shared African unity, our shared challenges, and our shared aspirations. To remind us of our roots, We've seen the video called I Am Africa. Um, that the purpose of that video was to remind us of our roots, our shared identity, our collective hope for the future, to pay attention to where we should be heading towards. Now, um, I would like to invite the minister. So the, the video has passed already, so sorry. Thank you. Your attention is much appreciated. For now, formally welcome us and to share his thoughts to his significant event. I am honored to invite to the podium the esteemed Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Morisanda Koyati. Est-ce que la traduction est assurée pour le président C'est bon Je 
this. Is it good? <coughs> is everything all right? Okay. Do you hear me? Can you hear me? I want to make sure everything is all right. Okay. Can you hear me? Is everything all right? Can you? Merci. Thank you. Your Excellency. And bro dear brother, Mr. Tabombeki. Excellency Ambassadors, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, occasion that governs us. Merci d'être venu en Guinée. Thank you for coming in. I have never a land of permission. Artificial division between Francophone and Anglophone, so we cannot talk here Swahili or Mandingo or Fulani or Kwasa. We should not need to have translation. But this is our past. So allow me, President, to speak in French because most of the participants are Francophone. Excellence, Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs, au nom du chef de l'État, son Excellence Colonel Mamadi Doumbouya, le président de la transition, le président du CNRD, President of Transition, I would like to wish you a welcome in Guinea on behalf of President Mamadi Doumbouya. on the Guinean toil or territory. When former President Sekou Toure said no to the French, it was both for the entire Africa and Guinea itself. It's an immense honor 
for the Guinean people and the entire Guinean government, and particularly for the president of transition, Colonel Mamadi Doumbouya, to see His Excellency President Thabo Mbeki coming here in Guinea with his foundation to celebrate for the very first time the African Union. Mr. President, it's you who chose Guinea. That's right. You did not mistake at all. No other country in Africa would claim President Nelson Mandela that Guinea itself, we have the right and we own the people to claim him, to have rights on him. We wish him welcome. We would not have put you in the right uh, house here, him. If President Nelson Mandela were here, with all your own right. To seal with former President Sekoutouré, to set up and fight for Pan-Africanism and fight against colonialism and the entry of the white people in the continent. I was very young, but I know what was happening. Uh, every other single country in Africa were having refuge in Guinea. All, every Saturday, he would go out and try to tour the city. He would go to Kindia, to Labi, everywhere on Saturdays. And we would use He used to do this, and he tried to train on us. And he was chanting and making a slogan, Free Nelson Mandela, Free Mandela. Abba Apartheid, fall down to Apartheid. We grew up in that, with chanting that, until they set President Mandela free. until he set himself free. They set themselves free. We didn't free them. I went to South Africa in Robben Island and I saw on my eyes the African Union and were with him where Mandela was, President Mandela. Like a cage. But and that did not deter them from their goodwill and their determination to set South Africa free. Peace, they went out from this inhuman uh, fight and inhuman uh, struggle. The hatred that we should have had against those who tortured them in the past for nothing. But they did not retaliate and they did that also on behalf of me. We say we forgive. We accept. We have been. We accept that as a sacrifice. And we want to do that in a united Africa. That's it. You, Mr. President, you grew up beside or alongside the fight. 
You grew up in the fight and struggle in apartheid system. That's why you now hold a position, you and I, in Africa, at this point, at this time. You are the right and rightful successor of President Mandela, legitimate successor. You have to be proud of that. And next to you, I am very proud to have been and chosen as the recipient or beneficiaries of the Nelson Mandela Prize of the United Nations on behalf of peace. And that was not for me only. It was only for the Guinean Alors, people and population. So when you choose Guinea to start your tour on your implement your foundation, I think you did not mistake at all. That's why President uh, uh, Dumbia entrusted me and has asked me to thank you, that to tell you that as of today, the Tambumbeki Foundation has a second uh, home that is Guinea. The second headquarters that is in Guinea. Any event or, or happening that should occur that can help enlighten or brighten your foundation will be our fight, come on fight and will be going in that respect. This fight against apartheid and enslavement against corruption. That's one of these uh, stronghold words. It's what we are fighting against. But, but uh, your position right now may be better than yesterday because, because right now your powers are somehow you are you are still fighting and, and President Colonel Mamadi Dumbuya. Again, welcome to Guinea. Welcome back to your country. And on behalf of President and on behalf of the Guinean population, we say thank you. Thank you for the population you have chosen. This is the land of Miriam Makeba. Here, that was her scene. This stage, she has occupied it several times. This is where she has been producing and performing. This is where she has been speaking to the world. From this very same stage where I stand, this is from where she was fighting and combating South Africa's apartheid system. This stage is brings to Nelson Mandela. Is yours as well. This land is yours. This stage that has been addressing the entire world, and the world has also been listening from here. I would like to thank you. You did not mistake. Welcome to Guinea, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for your very kind speech and wisdom, President and the enlightening to share his insight that you and to introduce to our esteemed speaker for this year's lecture, President Tabomboki. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. And thank you, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, Minister Kuyate. 
for that very warm welcome. And I must also say thanks a lot to uh, His Excellency the President, Tumbuya, for receiving us very well yesterday. And we continue to extend to him our respect. So, Honorable Minister, Your Excellency, uh, Your Excellency's Ambassadors and members of the Diplomatic Corps, <clears throat> and dear friends, as people have said, uh, the Africa Day Lecture has been given, now extended, delivered for 12 years. And we've done all of that within South Africa, but indeed we're always conscious of the fact that this was not a South African lecture, but an African lecture. And indeed, I must also say that uh, our friends across the continent have raised that thing with us for many times to say uh, we must not deliver this lecture only from South Africa, but also from other countries on our continent. And Your Excellency Minister, indeed, we are very, very glad indeed that we could come to Guinea as the first country after all of these other 12 years uh, in South Africa. And indeed, you are quite right, uh, Minister, that this was not an accident uh, because Guinea is a particular place, and Guinea is a particular place in the struggle for our own liberation. It's a unique place, and indeed, we were privil privileged ourselves a privilege to come here uh, for the purpose of this, of this lecture. And I must say, not to take too much time, uh, uh, Your Excellency, because there are many other people around the world who are listening. I'm sure they are very impatient to hear our lecturer, our esteemed lecturer. I'm uh, very, very glad indeed that we have as our lecturer today, our esteemed lecturer, the Africa Day Lecture, uh, Professor Grovogi, who is with us here, uh, born in Guinea, and an outstanding African scholar who is teaching uh, international relations theory in African political thought at Cornell University in the United States. Your Excellency Minister, whenever we've asked uh, people to deliver this lecture, it's also always on the basis of our respect, our respect for their intellect, our respect for their commitment to Pan-Africanism, our respect for their commitment to honesty. And so that's been our assessment of Professor Grovogui, that here would have an outstanding African lecturer, an esteemed lecturer, who would say something valuable not only to us in this hall, but throughout our continent and the African diaspora, say something very significant about the state of the continent and what we need to do essentially to achieve the renaissance of the continent. To give an indication, uh, Your Excellency Minister, about uh, the thinking of our esteemed lecturer, Professor Kovogi, I want to quote, I hope it won't be too long, a, re a response he got to a question that was posed to him in 2021. And the question was, how has the way you understand the world changed over time? And what or who promoted the most significant shifts in your thinking? And this was part of his response, uh, Your Excellency. He said, the war in Iraq shattered the window of, of opportunity after the collapse of the Cold War. The idea that we could return to the basis upon which the new world under the UN Charter was founded, multilateralism, mutual coexistence, mutual respect, rule of law, 
everybody abiding by international law, etc. The Iraq war for me closed that window. And what was frightening was that in official Europe, there was actually no situation, no sanction at any level, nor any unambiguous condemnation afterwards by any incorporated Euro Euro European body. And they say all of those things have echoes. If African people can per permit themselves to say, quote, we don't care about the International Criminal Court, unquote, it's partly because of Iraq. The lack of consequences for it led many to the conclusion that there was no universal justice, universal humanitarian morality, universal jurisdiction. European doublespeak around the world also said this a lot about European self-doubts about United States unilateralism, which has also caused many to rethink whatever expectations they had about the emergent role of Europe in the post-Cold War era. The debates about the fallout of the Iraq war were as much about Europe as they were about the US because people had hoped that Europe would rally around traditions such as the Geneva Conventions, the norms against aggression, and so on. He said at some point, Bush went to war against the public sentiment of America because the majority were opposed to it. But still, he had those core groups in the public that were for it and that were for it and thought they could afford him immunities and the right to re-election. He's saying here, Your Excellency, that we need to define up for ourselves, to think for ourselves. And he's giving an assessment here of the war of Iraq, on Iraq of Iraq, what, what happened there and what it means for us as Africans and not to be deluded by the mere use of words about multilateralism, mutual co coexistence, mutual respect, rule of law, when people are actually, the people who pronounce those ideas very forcefully are precisely the same people who violate them. We are very, very glad that we have him, Professor Kovoki, a Guinean, to talk to us today, to deliver, to talk for us today, the Africa Day Lecture. And I'm sure you will speak as much with such honesty about our continent as he did then when he answered that question. Professor Grovokwi, please. Thanks a lot. Excellence, Monsieur le Président, President. Excellence, Monsieur le Ministre, His Excellency, Mr. P Minister of Foreign Affairs, Excellency, Ambassadors, Ladies and Gentlemen, Honorable Guest, My name is Siba Zachalu Grovogi. I was born in Guinea. I was a graduate from Gamal Abdel Nasser University, promotion Behazen. Always loved Guinea and have maintained strong tie to it. Today I have belong to a strong group of Guineans. We have now for two and a half years of wait means that we have to come to Guinea to do something specific from north to south, 
we envisage the uh, institutions. Our themes have been consistent with the themes of today, the an African Renaissance. Before going further in my speech, please allow me to set a special word. I am a professor, a lec and I've really come I spoke about an institution that is specialized, uh, Trudy Hoff. Has His Excellency said it? I am an African. I am South African. Proud to be among the first. I remember that I have always been among the first. Live in the land where it all began, of Africa. Accompanying the first companion of Moses, Zaporazi, the first witness to crucifixion, other than those who committed the ultimate sin of it, Simon or Simon. I am proud to be with Bilal al Abashi. G Africa gave birth to the people who rendered others languages more than religious. The cultural expressions of enslaved Africans from the Caribbeans influenced in Asian Banaj. Action, Chen Yuren Ming. The one that was uh, the founder of um, the revolutionary of of China under Sun Yat-sen, just to mention that. Pamelares Lasky is a formerly enslaved African, formed the first modern republic. Although there is no single republic in the world that resembles it, they had a very special experience. Unmistakably, it existed longer than United uh, Soviet Union. But the longer of Sarasways, we'll always refer to them as a reference because when we remember as an African, we don't remember, we don't know where we are, and we also try to refer to them as a, a model. Africans, for example, I know we are all centered about that. Dar es Salaam, which is also the language of Swahili, um, illustration of cosmopolitan life in lingua franca. We don't remember that. We don't know where it comes from. The um, Roman Empire included Africa, the process of all human rights. First, they used the word slavery before getting into the laws. When Palmares were trying to forbid, in 1609, the founder of l modern letters, social sciences, or arts, were among them. And we, as uh, African unions, we try to go before the successors of. Uh, on the past, not to leave behind for people in 
Africa who are not uh, uh, let's say visitable. We never abandon our African land. Never ever. We didn't lose our roots and culture. I'm not saying it because of pride. But the question I ask myself today is that if we're a premier person, how can we explain how come that we are now the last? And the answer is we have to relate to our recent past. Colonialism or Western uh, action has uh, impacted us. different regimes that went through and morality have always been have always been partial and how we look at them to try to take a step back but I'm not trying to say that and try to make or compare compared to others I want us to look within that what we have within us and try to look into the future and we try to try to compare with the now structure that are in the world and see how the world function works is not necessarily the way we will see or want to us to work today we we notice the restraint of Africa while Africans are not behaving the way they should be and losing our culture and, uh, and treasures and values. We, we have to ask ourselves what will be happening of Africa today or tomorrow if we don't take measures now, if we don't participate in other things that can or the African in, uh, intelligence uh, artificial intelligence we have to admit that although we are enlightened today we have to look for better things in that's right but it's because we try to forget our past. We have slowly but surely given uh, away our lands to others. We did it because others have always thought that the necessity of urgency to lose our exigencies or urgencies or requests. And we go slowly and we try to leave way to that. And I'm not, etc. These imperatives that impose to us, etc., are coded as if they we belong to the morality, we uh, belong to them. So we have no other limits. Oh, oh we have uh, com universal competence, like in the past. We try to believe that Africans have never been interested in it. However, there is something worse that uh, is happening in Africa. Is the abandonment of Africa by its elites, either by necessity, or by cynicals, or by opportunism, meaning they want to go for opportunity. I cannot fix these sentiments. And the effects. What I'm concerned with is that many hopeful and engaged Africans that are not able to meet with others across borders. But there's something worse than that. We, 
graduate and uh, African churches, we all have uh, a continental structure. Egyptian lecturers and researchers, Ethiopians and Somalian academics or professionals, are not in sustained conversations with the South African, Namibians, and Congolese. Nor do Guinean thinkers converse with those of Niger, Chad, Cameroon, or else. They all inhabit disciplinary trenches from which they write and are for journals set up mostly for hours. We don't never take our request or our requirement. We always take for others. We consider others' requirements and necessities than ours. And it's not wicked. I'm, not, I'm saying it not from a wicked standpoint, no. But from an open mind and a very African deeply rooted person. We have to understand now, in most of the cases, But the pragmatism and solution that we are looking for uh, should be generated outside Africa, and that's what relegates us to the second position, or even the last. That's why I want to speak as an intellectual, and African intellectuals is no different from those of our young athletes. because there is no structure to retrain us here. There is nothing in such an infrastructure to keep us home and to be able to blossom out. This is an issue, and this is, but the problem could be solved. That problem could be resolved, but we need to talk about it. Our young artists, they go to Europe, mm, they have no neither the structure nor anything else to help them innovate and blossom out at home. That's why some people call it current or people other, other people call it globalization, but it's also called cosmopolitanism or transnationalism and the like. To the youth to the in my audience today, I must confess that the elders of which I am one of them, have not given them the scholarly and methodical tools and frameworks in order to confront the failures in Africa and in the Africa of Africa. Sometimes we miss, we, we miss the point to get to the concrete action, to get the practical action. Because on a tutor that I saw, the the concern or the issue of what will happen in Africa in the future and where will be the Africans? How will they get out of this? How will they be able to cope? In other terms or words, we are being marginalized and subjected to drastic other forms. In another word, uh, elucidation, we can pose the problem differently. How will you be able to continue to teach our children the way that we do? Does it serve our academic program at schools? The content, will that be of useful to us? Recently, I'm not saying it because, but I said no to some of the curricula, given the remarks that I made. And I want to speak here as an intellectual. How can we get to, in my, in my specific domain of uh, specialization, political science? I have nothing to do more in that respect, except that is not the only thing that others want to control us or study our curricular study. 
I taught that science in other Western countries. I did some conferences and seminars in other countries all over the world, in Japan and others. In the meantime, I taught in Europe and others. So today I am here to speak about my professional experience and what I have shared with others. If you are in my field in political science in the United States, you will, see you will know this first discipline of political science in American politics. Replace the adjective with British, French, Swedish, Spanish, and the like. You have the equivalent field. Of in the main field of um, political science, in the field of American politics, tells the story of American institution and development. Federal and local as it relates to all dimensions of constitutional, collective, and individual activities, like banking. But we never talk about slavery or exploitation of others, etc. We are like a indigenous, American indigenous, because they want to speak about themselves otherwise. I am concerned with it. The second domain in political science is the political theory. If I go in this kind of respect, This will be essentially a mental journey through time of the archives, canons, uh, human events leading to the ascension of Europe and the West. This is a traditional pitch by the European Renaissance as originating in ancient Greece and Rome, which provide Europe with the science. And after that, they refer to other texts we never stay, that uh, moral technologies are uh, benefiting from it. The idea that Greek belong to others, or Europe belong to our European and others, is a false idea. And we Africans, sometimes we say that this is coming from elsewhere or Europe or others. I will come back to that. But it's not true. The canons are theirs, but archives are ours. The third domain in international in political science is international relations. The role of international relations is to give the impression that it is ethically coherent to treat human beings differently on account of imperial needs and based on geography, race, culture, and others, and we try to justify it by, and by uh, other regimes of rights, and everything that they po possess has been God given. But what is most important is that the geography, geography or atlas or the culture of a region is embedded in also in political science. And, and when we go to class, we talk about realism. We have to keep, they have, they do not have the right to treat us as different. They have the right to treat us as different, and not the way they want to. We maintain the institution in um, law that the deeds for Europe, and solidarity, and others, etc., can possibly, in the level, is completely different. Violence is different. Conquest of others is another concept, is different. Wars or territorial occupation is, uh, has another understanding or connotation to, to them. And this position, the consent has legitimate, uh, if not necessary. 
the last field of political science is comparative politics. In the United States, this field is reinforced by regional studies departments. And that reflects the ambition of the United States government and um, American philanthropy to give effect to the American economic system. Someone who will work or study in China will have another vision. So, the preoccupation in this case is, is the state who did not know, who does not know how to govern or rule himself will be left uh, aside and will go astray. Most Africans who study political science are therefore oriented toward very fixed understanding of the world. They are not told in political theory that the authors whose ideas now form Western canons were in direct conversation with Africans. We know, for instance, that from indigenous onward, major great philosophers spend extensive times in Africa. No one went elsewhere except in Africa. I'm not saying it for the sake of pride or whatsoever, but that's the fact. It's true, and it's our land and our ex experience and our story that has been used. And other things in Africa have been complicated. For example, in other texts, nothing, nobody speaks about us. And they will never say that Timbuktu is a start, uh, Tombuktu started in the uh, Abbasi Empire, where we talk about the Muslims. And when the, when it went down, they tried to brought out this experience in Andalusia. And when they have been uh, sucked from that place, that's why the founder of Mourid in Senegal today as a person poet, but we have never been outside that. The archives will speak about it. For centuries we have been in touch with uh, Europeans, be it Muslim or Christians. question or the issue about the archive is extremely important because it's uh, all about our heritage and history. For example, in our disciplinary things, they will never tell that uh, in Egypt, in Egyptian instituted the meritocracy, they will never tell us that the Sahelian uh, population has been oriented toward the borders and countries. We never tell us that 200 years before the United States, they will never tell us that Haiti, the conception of human rights, has been embedded or imaginated in, in Haiti. But, but the Europeans will uh, use it otherwise and say something different about the reality. The obligations of uh, leading people to know that Guinea, that uh, Sunyata Keita fought against uh, Sumangarata and uh, he won over it. That Dar es Salaam and Wangara insisted long alongside the court that people of Korogo in 1776 and the revolution of a pearl in the third, which occurred in the same year as the American Revolution, either within the branch of one decision making. 
We are not reminded enough to the fact that before Sunjata defeated Sumangol Kanti, that Africa was uh, nearly on par with Britain in alchemy in that the Yoruba in Nigeria produce bluegrass. You know, what is really uh, hacking in, in the dom science domain, the, the Yoruba of Nigeria, they obtain and produce blue glass nearly a century and a half before its appearance in Europe. We have to tell the truth. There is much social, moral, scientific, and institutional experimentations on this continent to inspire us or to cause us uh, reject the dictatorship. We need to move forward from our clutches and our experience. And we have to find solutions adjusted and adapted to our realities, etc. If we know our own history and start from there, we'll make a positive path right to get to the future and we will not accept what is being imported. There is, there is nothing in our past or now that to teach us that we need to kill ourselves and so on and so forth. We need to live as one people and try to be an anomalous people and work out together for development. I'm not here to say counter truth or whatsoever. I want to see what I'm saying. We have enough space. The, the separation of powers. All of these uh, governance and uh, ruling management and style in old, deeply rooted in Africa, we are the one who gave birth to these. The idea that the, the body of an African person should keep its integrity. I'm not going to repeat what I said in the past. The ideas and the institutions are on in our hands. The leper of Mali, Bamako, or could be found, found out if we asking questions, for example. I give you if you go on Andalusia today, there are scientists who tell you that the problem between the herders and the cultivators in Mali you know who's uh, keeping these cultures? Because the management of Mali does not take uh, benefit the, the dwellers. We cannot take water and, and hay as our own. It's a God-given thing that we have to share. But people will fight against it and try to put us at war. Why am I saying all of this? Simply to tell you that. None of our conflicts, internal conflicts, and linked to the management of our resources, that we miss the idea of expressing a constitutional element. And of course, we refer to others in France, the United States, to manage and deal with our own issues and problems. People come to tell us here that uh, property is And they tell us that, that tell us in francophone countries that the land belongs to the government or the state. In France, they say that 
land belong to the clergy, to human being, and the French Revolution came to that. They said, they said that he, the land belongs to the government or state because this is the only party that can sell it to them and that they can be able to exploit it. No. So land belongs to the state or government to give it to others. Whereas we can have a public utility uh, land or services organized on that for the goodwill of the population. And we take it as it is because, because we refuse to think. I'm telling you. I'm not saying it against Mr. Vladimir Putin or whoever, whatsoever person in there. Mr. Nasser from Egypt. Gamal Abdel Nasser. Put a name to the imperial fantasy that Africans bore no relation to the environment that was constitutive of property. That lie which was given form by the lies of John Locke died when Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. Likewise, the post-World War II idea on self-determination had been construed by Western power to be no more than a rephrasing of the right of natives to dispose of themselves. And Patrice Lumumba paid the price for challenging that notion. And his uh, word was nothing but the right of people to dispose of their own land. And self-determination, that meaning as today. And the credit for it was unsurprisingly given to Nikita Khrushchev, who sponsored the applicable United Nations Resolution 1514. The declaration on that law. That did not mean that we didn't have the right to choose our own chief, our own leaders, and our own land. We didn't have the right to that. The different governments of Ethiopia and Liberia before the International Court of Justice did not, no pun intended, to align international legal jurisprudence in line with post-colonial realities than any other actions. Of course, look at Japan today. They have the same case. People do not rise uh, all of a sudden so I would decide of all. No, they didn't do that. It's only African who did that. The judge or the prosecutor. I'm telling all of this because I would like to you to understand that Africans have the right to dispose of themselves and their, and, and their land and they have to think how to do that. We have changed this word but it is never mentioned in the books. They have not risen up like that all of a sudden from Harvard University, for example, to do this. Let me get to the population. I started saying that that we don't speak much to ourselves without having instructional map or things that can lead us to orient us. Our leader here today, Mr. Kabombeki, is part of these leaders that has enlightened us and show us all our values that can be a good and heritage. Identify our values and rights can be fruitful. Pres President Becky was preceded by as other predecessors like William Tolbe and others, uh, good African thinkers, Kwame Nkrumah and Sekutwe. And President Becky is one of the rarest, except from Marcus Garvey, who believed in the idea of African Renaissance. The foundation of President Becky 
is one top notch that should be supporting that respect. We believe that we're not trying to compare the Africans. But what I want to say is that Nepal and the Renaissance, African Renaissance, contain some elements that are deeply rooted in our values and that can help us progress and be developed. I'm not here to defend President Gabonbeki's positions. I'm not here either to destroy things. But, but today, President Beki is inspiring and should be a good leader and role model to us. He wants us to rehabilitate our own Africa and the land and the African people. He wants us to be as one people. It all depends on our institution as well. We are not the only one. Mr. Malcolm said we need to have a very strong structure that can not only help us speak about our values and, and our own tradition. I'm not saying that we have to do like others, but we can have something originate and original and that can originate from Africans and be solved on our own, like cases in Somalia. We have, we have nothing in place to support initiatives of different governments or the researchers or university graduates or artists or lecturers. When someone tried to do that or initiate something positive, they denounce him and uh, Radio France International or other international media will uh, consider it otherwise. But we need to have an, an institution in Africa that will govern Africans. The idea of that kind of institution is not original. It's not new. We say sometimes that between 1700 it will not stop that by saying that in we had the French Academy, nor the British African, the learning of this, the collection of our memories. I'm not going, we don't, should not repeat the same mistakes. The idea of a collective idea or collective people, each in his own understanding, modern sensibilities, how they say, the French Academy was created in 1666 and the British Academy in 1600. Japan, under Emperor Meiji, uh, sent its most important scholars in all knowledge fields and disciplines in Britain, German and elsewhere to acquaint themselves with modern practices in science, technology and others in order to advance his country. The U.S. simply took land from India to allocate has land grants universities with the specific agenda of aiming America in excelling in what land and treasure afforded it. In Turkey too, Mustafa Kemal Pasha, also known as Ataturk, helped push his country in the direction of young Turk over the young Ottomans to modern Turkish government, life, culture, and the like. Before the end of his term, he tried to put something in place that became an heritage. Different uh, African disciplines should be each of them to came to answer a specific answer, a, a specific question. Thus, the discipline of geography, for example, which emerged uh, as field of study between 1535 and 1548, 45, 
in response to the so-called age of discovery, the new anthropology between 1585 and 1595 in anticipation of settlements in the new world, political economy, 1605, 1615, after British East India and others, how to organize all of this? I'm not against science, no, not at all. The, prong, the problem is that we have to define the way that we Africans should understand science and practice it. It's not that we don't have science in Africa, we don't, we don't want to practice it. But it should be done the way it should be. When I told our task, we Africans, I mean, is to think or to innovate, to imagine the knowledge, so to speak. And in order of, uh, instead of uh, copying others, we have that intelligence and that gut. It's not impossible. I'm not only saying because some of our friends would say uh, we consider it otherwise. No. New science. We have to encourage young people, but we we'll never get to it. If we don't talk to if we don't talk to one another, if we don't share human sciences, social sciences, everywhere in the world has relayed has been put in place and supported by institutions and people have talked to one another, have put in place strong and solid infrastructure and institutions to uh, continue and promote it and develop it. The African solidarity, the true African solidarity is mental. I'm telling you that. It's moral. I'm not here to make any assertion but Africa needs an academy of its own. That's my point and that's my word. And Africa has the solution to that. We will not continue to uh, quench fires here and there in Africa. And Africans even do not know how to associate their peers in order to solve our problems in an African way. I just want to remind you of something. After the FNT, we had a, a national conference. Everybody said, everybody, everybody said alternatives, meaning alternatives or shifting of power. No one. When, for example, a, ca a car broke, we don't change the car automatically. We try to repair the car, try to see how to fix it and try to make it our own and move forward. Particularly in Africa, we have to consider that idea and see how we can move forward. When we say, when we say, for example, like microphone, please. No. We cannot appoint the Minister of Justice and the General Prosecutor together at the same time. We need to see how things work. We have to think. We cannot uh, uh, grab things here and there uh, randomly like that. We have to be able to stand and sit down and think. And we need. We have to be able to anticipate different conflicts and fights in Africa. And considering our own resources, human resources, and any other one, the African wisdom requires us to sit down and talk, like we used to do in the past for our with our ancestors, and try to see how we can solve our own issues. If we are able to do that, we can solve the issue in Mali, in Burkina Faso, and in other. I'm not saying that we have to reject the Western tra values and other things immediately. No. But there is no African blueprint or no African touch in any of these. We have to try to solve things from the African perspective as well, and which is sometimes very pain.
We don't leave others to solve our issues when we can do it. It's from all our common interest. They try to present us their models and uh, realities, but does it match with ours? Not necessarily. They may have some good things, but we should be able to promote ours and see how we can fix ours uh, in to our own benefit and our own good. For years, we have been mistaken by thinking that our ideas do not mark with our... No, it doesn't work this way. It's not the problem of science, or we are not matching with that. Thoughts and ideas uh, could be true, and they could be taught in different schools and considered otherwise, but our realities are also different, and, and we should be able to match with these. Again, and this is uh, Franz Canon, Albert Mami, Malcolm X, and Steve Biko, who are not mistaken in making the connection between enslavement and the capture of the minds of the slaved by the enslaver. Think of Mali. This uh, conflict. But the right of uh, possessing a line and the right of uh, doing different is is different. In Mali, the right started with the founding of a land. We are all confronted with the same problem, and we should speak from the same voice, one single voice. How our children should. Mimit, mimit us in that respect and follow in the footstep. Archives that others have, these are theirs. Miss Aminata Traore was partly correct in the viol de l'imaginaire. For instance, he and the Francophone France has provided a needed institutional infrastructure in of collaboration between French and African universities. but we should find out the right word and the right ways. We will never develop Africa. We will never have African Renaissance if we don't have the, the right thought and the right institution and the right people. We have to learn, we have to finish and stop f from apprenticeship. Anybody comes to power can innovate. But we never gave the means to Africans or leaders in Africa to work out the way they should, and we have given way uh, to corruption. We need, we should not be spectators or watchers. And the only way not to do that is to give hands to hand to one another and try to sit and think on our world. Our traders and businessmen, our artists, our young people need that and need needs and need means to work out and get to that direction. We need some time to sit down and rethink that. Think, rethink our institutions, rethink our way of doing things, our manners, the academy that I'm talking about. How can we possibly have it? We have state people and we have resourceful people. We can put in place this institution. Everything I have promised to President Tabombeki, His Excellency, before the end of July, I think we can have this reality we can become true. And uh, we will have a word today, and we can promise President Tabo Mbeki that by the end of July we can have this uh, come true. 
because it exists already. In fact, we have the instituted by Mr. President. And we've seen that the foundation of Mr. Tabonke should be intact. And it should be a workable institution. If His Excellency the President accept a reposition or repositioning, uh, organizing a forum between those who have the capital and the money in the industries, professors and others, no other intellectual group and others can come and counterattack them. The academy that I have in Guinea is not a government project. It's not a project of the Ministry of Education. Science does not belong to the government or to the state. It's the scientists. It's their own. The intellectual and elite, the researchers and the university graduates that should come there to think and find solutions to our problems. I'm not excluding the government. No, they can have some contribution, but My African Academy should be working jointly with the state and the government to find solutions to our problems. We're not going to ask any government or any African to ask to give some money. But whoever would give will tell everybody this is our own common heritage, do what you can. But it will not go through a single president or a single academy statement. The academy should not be in South Africa or Morocco or whatever in Africa. Will we put either in Cape Verde or what? We don't want it to be dominated by only one single person. The academy will depend The Labombeki Library will be free antennas. We already propose that every year, President Labombeki will find will find ourselves somewhere uh, around a single topic to be debated or discussed. Intellectuals, uh, humanitarians, even head of states, who can come and discuss that with us. Only one topic at, at, this, at a time, natural science, political science, uh, geography, whatsoever, but one single topic discussed at one time. Nothing here in, in Guinea here that prevent us from doing that. And I'm sure we can get to it. With the blessing and support of President Tabombeki, we'll get to it. The foundation works we have the intellectuals and the light for that, the human resource capable to do that. Who are not even me. It, it will be other people. But the African continent needs its intellectuals and its human resources. We cannot export someone for that. So in July, we'll try to see how we can implement this uh, project and make it a reality. And uh, before we invite him here, we call it the Commitment of Conakry or the Conakry uh, Convention. It's not a state convention. We owe that to our children, to our people, to everybody. We have to do that. We owe it to everybody. Nature has not given us all of these and we will deprive ourselves for that. So when I said I would come today, I would do not show it, but I am probably a single person to continue promoting that, but it's all together that we can get to that. His Excellency President Tabombeki, uh, Excellency uh, Prime uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, you have the mental capacity, you have the mental thought, you have 
if you think that we can do it for our Mr. Jumbo Talbe, Bismarck, Ataturk, Francis Bacon did for uh, the continent. Why not us? So let us accept to assemble and gather. You give us the space to say what we want and do what we want. We'll give you, we'll leave you with an heritage. Thank you very much. It is now time for some reflection on the lecture and on the role of Papumbothi's African School of Public and International Affairs in catalyzing Africa's renewal. Please welcome Professor Edith Paswana. His Excellency, Patron of the Tabundeku Foundation, Honorable Minister in the Transitional Government of Guinea, the Chair of the Foundation, Ms. Geraldine Fraser Muleketi in absentia, the Chair of Council, Mr. Maboya of UNISA, the Vice Chancellor of UNISA, Professor Lengabula, um, the Ambassador of South Africa uh, to Guinea, Professor Solimullo, members of the Diplomatic Corps present here, allow me to stand on existing protocols and say, ladies and gentlemen, bonjour. Je m'appelle Edith Paswana, Professor and Director, African Development, University of South Africa, and the Tawambiki uh, School of Public and International Affairs. Is it fine? Okay, thank you. Je suis très honoré de participer à ce moment historique de notre continent. Je vous apporte les salutes chaleureux de et Africa du Sud. The African word and the African common heritage. Uh, warm greetings from the Green School and UNISA, one of the oldest institutions in South Africa. UNISA is one of the uh, oldest distance education in the world. And this year, on the 24th of January 2023, UNISA will be celebrating 150 year birthday uh, of existence. It is the mother to all universities in South Africa. So uh, this year, we are looking forward to see you in South Africa. So the, T the Tabombegi African School of Public and International Affairs is one of the largest and recent innovations of the partnerships that the Tabombegi Foundation enjoys with UNISA. And it's a perfect model of the private-public partnerships in achieving uh, the much-needed African Renaissance. The school emerged out of a conversation with several former heads of states uh, that tasked President Mbeki to establish an entity that would train a critical mass of change agents and thought leaders to, uh, uh, on the continent for the social, political, cultural, economic renewal of the continent and its people from the Pan-African paradigm. President Mbeki believing in the value of education 
and our institution in the pursuit of African Renaissance and trust that UNISA to contribute uh, and to incubate this initiative since 12 October 2009. And over the years, the school has evolved to form a premier school of significance on the continent. My role today is just short, and I'm requested to reflect on the lecture of Professor Sieber and uh, also to look at this lecture in relation to um, the school that the Tabumbeki Foundation has founded at UNISA. Uh, as we can see, this is a school of significance, a very premier school, which will educate and not instruct Africans towards self-determination, uh, as Professor, uh, 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 Professor Koboki has been saying. And in short, Prof Professor Siba, I'm saying that the foundation of the school is premised on such a collaboration uh, that believes in the logic uh, of, uh, of actors of development, not your normal actors of development as predicated by the Bretton Woods institutions which were a state actor in the market, but a conglomeration of all these actors F, as you have espoused them here on the platform. And uh, in that way, I am uh, concurring with what you have been proposing here. And my role as I reflect in this lecture, this lecture is a powerful platform for all Africans to pitch ideas which can be implementable towards the renewal of Africa or what we term the African Renaissance. And I'm privileged to be here in Guinea as our first entry into the region and to be responding to a very profound lecture with key actions which Prof. Siba gave this morning, uh, this afternoon, and I must first commend him for com coming with practical solutions to the problems of Africa as a start. And this for me is commendable. We have been theorizing for too long and this lecture is offering an opportunity uh, for action imagination, imaginaries as Africans. And these are some of the things, uh, uh, the themes that I'm, still, I'm distilling out of this lecture. A few points which I would also indicate how the TM School at UNISA can take advantage on this process. And Prof. Siba in his lecture, he begins with a provocation of if we were first, you may ask then, why does it seem like we are the last today? And to which he responds a good deal of it has to do with how we understand ourselves in this contemporary moment. And this provocative lecture call for all of us as Africans to do self introspection and be wary of the threats that lies ahead because of the, the world is not stagnant, but the world is evolving and there are threats that are coming. A profound lecture indeed, and I will quickly point a few aspects that registered and resonates with the ideals of this new African school called the TM School, which seeks to be a magnet of excellency globally. And as we, we, we imagine this school, because this school is not a school for South Africans, it's not a school for South Africa, but it's a continental school, a continental African school that every one of us in this hall today will need to to embrace and be able to be part of this new invention at UNISA and the Tabumbeki Foundation. Uh, Professor Siba, you have underscored the need for a truly African university, not universities in Africa. And I'm going to dwell on this point because the imagination and the conceptualization of the, uh, the TM school is premised on the fact of providing an education that will liberate the African and be able to imagine uh, the future together. African institutions, including our universities, many of them on the continent, even though we call them African universities, are at very best westernized universities located in Africa. And by westernized universities, I am talking about universities whose canon of thought and knowledge structures are located in the West. And particularly if you imagine the social sciences and political sciences, that's supposed to be able to bring about the needed development that we need. And perhaps let me also emphasize that the knowledge foundations 
of a westernized university, which we might have been calling African universities today, is predominantly racist and sexist. And Prof. Siba has used a metaphor of political science and international relations to adequately demonstrate this. Uh, the role of international relations, as he says, gives impression that it is ethically coherent to treat human beings differently on account of imperial needs and based on geography, race, culture, and religion, and I close quote. So politi polit political science, in his view, is full of erasure without acknowledging that there was an engagement with Africans and other citizens of the world in its construction. And he uses the American political science and uh, international relations uh, to be able to, uh, to, to show that. The second aspect is that Africa needs to be able to embrace its own diversity and operate from that premise. And unless we take the notion of diversity and pluriversality here in Africa, we may find ourselves not succeeding in achieving the much needed African Renaissance. And, and as he says, as he said in the lecture, we need this to be able to groom future generations and we need to allow these contradictory and convergent uh, intellectual movements to work together to imagine the future. Every knowledge system and thought processes in the world start, start from the premise of self-affirmation. And I think he has taken time to show us using Greece, Greece using Rome, using Asia, and all other civilization that we can imagine outside of Europe and the West and to which he has given us all this example. Uh, for Africa, self-determination is not a privilege. It's a must, it's something that we should be doing and we need to do. And the question is how can we be able even to, uh, to imagine how to defend our African imaginaries and imaginis, imaginations if we don't pursue this idea of self-determination as Africans. The problem with Africa as it encounters other worlds or other civilization is that Africans are the ones who are expected to erase their Africanness when they, when they encounter other civilization. And I think this is what this lecture also uh, emphasized today. The other aspect that was really emphasized in the lecture is the idea of the locus of enunciation. From where are Africans speaking from? What is our locus of enunciation? Do we speak from the place called Africa? Do we speak, speak from the mind of an African? Or do we speak as other worlds are dictating for us on what we need to, to do? And this he underscored very adequately in the lecture. And therefore, it's, it's, it's a, a, a incumbent of us as Africans to begin to imagine an Africa from our own vantage point of the locus of financiation, which is Africa, this continent. The other aspect that uh, he mentioned is the shrinking, the shrinking, the symbolic shrinking of Africa and Africans, which is continuing. And put otherwise, it, we talk of invisibilization, we talk of also erasure, erasure of Africa and Africans on the global map. And this has to do predominantly with the contestation of being at a global level. Because this erasure of Africa and Africans, even on the continent and the descended diaspora, it's, it's becoming a big problem in terms of the type of knowledges, publications that we also want to, to take out. And it is upon us as Africans to excavate, to begin to excavate, because in the lecture, he has actually given us a long list of the discoveries, a long list of the achievements of Africa. But the question is, today, where are they and what are we doing with those discoveries, those uh, 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 um, uh, achievements that we have had in the past? He also points to the abandonment of Africa by its intellectual and for this, he's saying it's either pessimism, cynicism, or expediency. 
And the, my question is whether we have African intellectuals abandoned Africa, or are they just following a wrong script? Because it's possible that we might be thinking we are doing the work, because when I look at publications and the work and the knowledge that is produced on the continent, uh, it has been increasing. But the question is, why, which, whose script are we writing? Which question, whose questions are we responding to as Africans as well? And this also, he, he, he tries to juxtapose with the, the polarization that we see on the continent according to regions, according to languages, and I think even the minister touched on that. And, and, and uh, uh, until we have the courage as Africans to come together and imagine Africa with one voice, these, some of these th needed uh, uh, ingredients that we were given this uh, today to, towards the African Renaissance might not be able to, to, to be achieved. Again, the lecture also touched on why Africa is not able to benefit from its talent and skills. Why are Africans everywhere? Whether they are athletes, whether they are artists, whether they are academics, we don't find them uh, benefiting Africa. And why is the situation like this? To which he attributes the lack of superstructure and infrastructure to operate at home. So even the idea of globalization, cosmopolitan, in many cases, while it's, an, it's, 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 it's a good idea, it's not benefiting Africans. And therefore the question is whether should we be actually promoting those ideas that really put us as Africans out of uh, the margins of society. The idea of a shared wisdom over centuries is also a noble idea that came out of this lecture. However, we need to also imagine that the global power structures are asymmetrical in nature and are built on knowledges of the West, as I've already indicated earlier. And unless Africa and Africans begin to view themselves as peers within this unequal partnership that is in the world, we might not be able to be able to even reach the African Renaissance that we are, we are, we are, we are imagining. Of course, there were some takeaways that one has been uh, uh, trying to, to take from the lecture. And what our school, a school such as the one that is called the Tabombeke African a School of Public and International Affairs can do to make some of these ideals in the lectures of this theory in the lectures practical. First of all, a school of this nature needs to unapologetically, deliberately, seek to insert an African canon, knowledge, system, methodologies, philosophies, and make them central to global knowledge systems. And in my views, Africans should begin to imagine the idea of a pluriversity rather than a university. Because the current university that we are working on is, is, is premised on one knowledge system that everyone should marshal after. Therefore, to think of a pluriversity is to think about Chinese knowledge, Indian knowledge, African knowledge, all finding equal stature within the academy in a, a university or a school of this nature. And Africa is the best place to make this ideal a possibility because of the diversity uh, that uh, Africa has in the world. Because young Africans are getting impatient about this ideal and all that we need is courage. And today this lecture has given us uh, uh, some of the tools on how we can go around uh, making this an ideal. Uh, if Africans could move away from amnesia as he was talking, uh, as, as he was giving the lecture about our amnesia, to forget the histories, to, to forget even the, uh, the achievements that Africa has. And where we, we tend to recognize uh, certain ideas, norms, that are not in tandem with us. And this school, for us, in the lecture, I think you have heard him talking about the Sahel, the Sahel and and some of the things that were preventable 
in that area, uh, uh, you know, if we relied on our institutions and relied on practices uh, to, to resolve uh, disputes, uh, which involves land, territory, and, 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 and some of these uh, uh, natural resources that you can think of. And in Africa, as he, mention, he mentions, access to resources is, is predicated by the principles of Ubuntu, human solidarity, which dictates that access to resources cannot be managed through boundaries, or they are not bound. And if we had actually went back to think about this, we wouldn't have, be having the situation that we have at the Sahel. And it is precisely, I'm not a lawyer, but he was saying, is constitutional dispositions which erase this principle of human solidarity, Ubuntu, and humanity that Africans share over time. Because in Africa, we don't say because when there is a river, we say there is a line or there's a border, you need to pay something to come and get the water this side. People can show. And the school has introduced a focus area, particularly to deal with some of these issues called livelihoods and natural resource management as a focus area of study for Africans to begin to imagine this from their vantage point or from their locus of financiation. Uh, Prof has also talked about the absence of institutions that coalesce our efforts, the lack of them. You know, we lack structures that allow us to convene more robustly, he argued, to which he's proposing for a multi-stakeholder structure that is independent of state and strategically located not on the hegemons like South Africa, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and all these hegemons of Africa, you can think of Egypt. And I concur with him because the current structures, due to their history and origin, will not be able to serve Africans well because of these foundations. But in, what is not clear from his lecture is advocate, whether he's advocating for overall of the current systems and institutions, which that is not coming clear for me. But what is clear is that he's suggesting that we need to do that and it does not have to have stayed inside. And Prof Siva was short of saying that perhaps NEPAD, APRM, and all these powerful structures, noble structures that were, 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 were imagined, were not, the state was not the rightful custodian for them. And perhaps we should have worked with the conglomeration that he is proposing of all stakeholders, whether they are artists, researchers, and uh, 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 all these um, uh, stakeholders and actors that he, he mentioned in the lecture. And I like the idea that uh, science is not an enemy, uh, uh, an enemy, science is not an enemy uh, to some of this uh, uh, proposal because in his, in his own ways, our multiplicity and pluralism may be daunting, but pluralism, diversity, non-conformism, and more importantly, transgression of orthodoxies are not enemies of sciences. They are its friends, and I close quote. So the TM School has been founded to excavate and thus hidden knowledge and to be the, at the forefront of invention and logic of discovery. And in its conception, the idea of transdisciplinarity was, was precisely to be able to do that, to begin to imagine the African Renaissance in a transdisciplinary manner. And I think the lecture also touched on this predominantly. And the school also seeks to produce graduate that will contribute to global discoveries. Prof. Siba has already chronicled a long list of these discoveries. Young Africans, he says, should be part of the discoveries in the fourth and industrial, uh, fifth industrial revolution in a school such as the one that we can have that. And if we can be able to, to come together with this initiative that he was proposing, we will be all able to generate knowledge that will bring about efficiencies and effectiveness in the public sector, also post-COVID-19 that we had, or many of the pandemics 
that have a past and that are yet to come. And this new initiative that he proposed will help us also to establish an African continent-wide approach to teaching, learning, and training. The school will take seriously some of the proposal in shaping and strengthening, strengthening our curriculum. And the school has already engaged with universities yesterday here at Ghana. Emphasis at, at Guinea, my apologies, at Guinea. The, the, the significance of collaboration and partnership was also emphasized in such uh, a, a, an initiative. So in a nutshell, the TM school is for all of us and I am here to say these lectures are a good platform for us to imagine what we can do with the current education system to ensure that we provide the future generation with methodologies, philosophies, and tools to be able to imagine the future together. I thank you. Merci. Thank you, Professor Paswana. Your insights and reflection were invaluable. And now, to close this significant event, I am honored to call upon Mr. Max uh, Bakwana, CEO of the Tebu Mbeki Foundation, to deliver closing remarks. Thank you, Fatwa. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you, you will be very happy to know that I'm not a professor. So I'm not professing anything. I'm not going to keep anybody for that long on this, uh, on this podium, especially taking to account that we've got a concert, which I think is very important for all of us. But, um, uh, Minister, I need to say, as the Tabombegi Foundation and, the, and, the, and UNISA, we are very, very glad today that we're returning to this place and a place to which we belong, to follow in the footsteps of Governor Mbeki, on the resilience of Nelson Mandela, to pay homage to the land that produced the compatriots of Oliver Tambo, such compatriots and companions, Ahmed Sekwature and Diello Teli. This place, <laughs> this place that was once a home to Kwame Nkrumah, a home to Amilka Cabral, who inspired many of us for the total liberation of our continent. Even closer to some of us, this is a place that was once a home to our mother and grandmother, Miriam Zenzile Makeba, whom we honor immediately as we close this session, to which all of you are invited um, to that uh, concert to honor Mamu Miriam. We are glad that we have amongst us President Tabombeki, who continues to command the stars to shine on Africa and remind us that we are the children of the great warriors. We never surrendered against the mighty French armies in the Asian Revolution. We are born of warriors that humiliated the Italian forces against imperialism in the Battle of Adwa in Ethiopia. We are grandchildren of the great warriors who defeated the English imperialists in the Battle of Isandwana. He gives us confidence that not only Africa can be reborn, that here stands the midwives of an Africa that is reborn. We are grateful, therefore, to our patron for his untiring commitment to a better Africa. We now return to this place exactly to reaffirm our commitment to the ideas and practice of Pan-Africanism as our forebears did 60 years ago. We are grateful to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Government of Guinea for the manner in which they welcomed us and facilitated our safe arrival in Conakry. We are particularly happy, Minister, that the government he stated its commitment to Pan-Africanism as was stated by the Supreme Leader, Colonel Mama Dumbaya, yesterday to us. And we pray that in the end, 
a government that the people of, of Guinea wants is beckoning, and that will be achieved and done peacefully. We wish to thank our lecturer, Professor Siba Grovoki, not only for the intellectual feast that he prepared and provided to us this evening. From this, it is clear that we should be engaged with the rest of the continent in the next 12 months to try and practicalize the issues that Edith has just distilled. We thank Professor Siba for another reason, for being one of the provocateurs that reminded us that our responsibility as a foundation goes beyond the river Limpopo. He did not only make this as a suggestion, but he fully participated in the preparatory activities that led to this event. In him, Mr. President, we found a dependable soldier in our quest to rid our continent of ignorance, of poverty, of burden of disease, and foreign domination. It is also not a cliche to, to say this would not have been possible without the timeless and generous material intervention of MTN, of Anglo Gold Ashanti, of African Development Bank, of TELUS Holdings, and our dear friend Lansana Savannah. Working with all of you colleagues made us to feel good to be Africans. You have in our eyes destroyed the false dichotomy that the direction and the work to rebuild our continent is the exclusive responsibility of the politician. It is not. It is a collective responsibility of all of us. We are proud to be associated with you and hope that we will continue um, to do so as we undertake other programs. We also thank the Foundation and the UNISA Board for agreeing that we be here today and for the support they have provided to our team as we prepare for this evening. It will be remiss for me not to thank our project uh, team under the guidance and leadership of Lubin Naisa, who led both the foundation and the TM school teams as they prepare for this event. You guys, in my view, have been phenomenal. But as I was saying to one of our bosses here, Mr. Palazzi, we still have to bed work on Monday. <clears throat> and this appreciation we extend to our program director who has really led this event in a very professional manner and she has done a sterling job tonight. More importantly, genuinely each one of you present in this room and those that are listening at home, you have made our work worthwhile and thank you for joining, so for joining us this afternoon or this evening, wherever you are, this is for you. And for that matter, we will also value your feedback as to how we can do this better than we have done today and have done in the past 12 years. We thank in particular the members of the media as some of those that have traveled far from the bottom of our continent to be here today. I'm glad that we had the type of media houses and media practitioners that have been with us, th with us this week in Guinea, making it very clear that they refuse to be mere spectators in the quest for the rebirth of our continent, but have committed themselves to be active participants. I wish to thank everybody that has participated in prayers, in good thoughts, in, in support. I see many young people here that have been doing the organization and all of you that are present here today for making this a success that it has become. I just now to return finally to the benediction of the Holy Fathers that were standing here earlier and we accept their blessings and continue to pray that may our Creator place you, all of you, in the palm of his hands, keep you, protect you, guide you, shine his face on you, and give you peace until we meet again. Merci beaucoup.
Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, dear friends of the Tefumboki Foundation and representatives of the University of South Africa, we have come to the conclusion to the 13th Tefumboki Africa Day Lecture. I am filled with gratitude for your presence, both physical and virtual, and for your thoughtful engagement with our speakers' insights, and I have no doubt that the richness of today's discourse will inspire each one of us to contribute towards the, pro the positive changes our continent seeks. I want to extend our deepest gratitude to Mr. Max Bakwana for his eloquent closing remarks. Allow me to once again express our profound thanks to our generous sponsors, Anglo Gold Ashanti, the African Development Bank, and MTN Group. Your steadfast support and commitment have been an instrumental um, in the success of this significant event. We appreciate your shared dedication to Africa's development, unity, and intellectual growth. After such an enriching and insightful afternoon, I invite you all to take a break and enjoy some light refreshments. We will reconvene in about 45 minutes for the Maria Makeba tribute concert as we honor and remember the iconic figure. Let us also appreciate um, and celebrate the richness of our African culture and heritage. Mary Makeba, known as Mama Africa, used her music as a tool for social justice, her voice resonating with the struggle and aspirations of our continent. Today, as we, pray, as we pay tribute to her legacy, we also recognize the power of art culture in uniting us in telling our stories and in shaping African identity. Before I close, uh, let me remind each and one of us that the journey towards Africa's renaissance is a shared responsibility. Let the discussions and the reflections from today's lecture be the catalyst for the action in our respective spaces. Let's keep the conversation going. Let's continue the challenge, inspire each and one another, and together we can create a prosperous Africa we all desire and deserve. Thank you for your time and active participation. Please enjoy the refreshments and I will look forward to seeing you soon at the Maya Makeba Tribute Concert. <laughs>